safe to start. I would like to uh, officially welcome you to the 18th in a series of Zoom lectures presented or sponsored by Congregation KINS. As most of you know, the topics are STEM related with a correlation to Torah. We are honored to again have Rabbi Yona Reese as our speaker for today. And his topic is environmentalism and halacha. As I did the last time, I'm going to abbreviate Rabbi, Bre Rabbi Reese's bio. I listed all of his accomplishments It would take up way too much of his allotted time. Rabbi Reese is a summa cum laude graduate of Yeshiva University, received his law degree from Yale Law School, received smicha from Reese at YU with the distinction of Yadin Yadin. He is a noted Torah scholar, attorney, and jurist, and currently serves as the Abbez Din of the Chicago Rabbinical Council. He is also a Rosh Hashiva at Reitz at YU. He occupies the Rabbi Katz Chair in Professional Rabbinics and has previously served as the Max and Marion Grill Dean of Reitz. He also has served as the Director of the Bez Din of America from 1998 to 2008. He's a member of the New York State Bar Association and the American Bar Association and a frequent writer and speaker on topics related to both Jewish and secular law. Uh, as always, you will have two opportunities to ask questions of Rabbi Reese. You may interrupt him at any time by unmuting yourself and asking a question, or after his presentation, I will give you another opportunity to do so. It's now my pleasure to turn the program over to Rabbi Reese. Thank you very much, uh, Steve. It's truly uh, an honor to present uh, again uh, at the Kinza STEM lecture uh, series. Thank you uh, for organizing uh, these lectures. I know that people are gaining a tremendous amount uh, from them. Uh, so I want to uh, first um, uh, dedicate uh, the lecture to uh, the memory of uh, my uh, mentor at the Chicago Rabbinical Council, Rav Gedai Dov Schwartz Zatzal, who's a Shloshim. We're going to be commemorating in uh, just uh, a couple of days. And if you take a look at Rabbi Schwartz's um, most recently published Sefer, Shari Gedula, which contains a number of the Divrei Torah that was shared and imparted by uh, Rabbi Schwartz, uh, it includes a whole section on the topic of Baal Tashkis, the prohibition against wanton destruction of natural resources. And um, therefore, I felt that it was uh, appropriate on some level to honor his memory by speaking about uh, this subject, uh, which uh, was near and dear uh, to, uh, to his heart uh, as well. Uh, environmentalism sometimes is confused by people uh, as a, a political agenda. And uh, there's a question, what political party do you belong to as to whether you should care about the environment or not care about the environment? So, so I wanted to dispel that notion uh, just for starters, uh, that the Torah is not about a part particular political party or movement. The Torah believes in certain ethics and certain principles independent of uh, anybody's uh, political affiliation. And I want to speak about uh, the Torah perspective, the Jewish perspective uh, towards uh, the environment, uh, independent of any such uh, political uh, considerations uh, so that we can have the proper Torah orientation towards uh, this issue to uh, govern our own lives. And the truth of the matter is that uh, there's a built-in tension when uh, dealing with the environment, uh, which was noted by none other than Rav Yosef Dov Soloveitchik, uh, uh, of blessed memory, uh, who uh, in his uh, famous uh, essay uh, called The Lonely Man of Faith, he um, addressed two different competing narratives that appear at the very beginning of the Torah in Sefer Bereshis, the first chapter of Sefer Bereshis and the second chapter, and notes that there's a disparity um, in terms of how Adam Harishon, the first man who was uh, created, how he is uh, described in terms of his uh, mission and in terms of the prerogatives that he was given. In the first chapter of uh, Bereshis, we're told that that uh, man was blessed was created man, male and female. God said to his creations, go and conquer the world. Um, that uh, you will have complete reign, 
complete control over all of the other creations uh, that HaKadosh uh, Baruch Hu placed into this universe, which sounds on some level like an unbridled prerogative given to uh, original man uh, to uh, use natural resources however man sees fit. This is what uh, the, uh, the Rav, Rav Soloveitchik, described as majestic man. Majestic man given kind of this uh, unfettered uh, ability uh, to um, control the world or at least to utilize the resources of the world apparently at his own whims. However, in the second chapter of uh, Beratius, of uh, the narrative of the creation of uh, the world, we're given a slightly uh, different type of uh, imperative where man is told, God took man by Nicheo began Eden, put him in the choicest portion of his universe in Gan Eden, to serve and to conserve, uh, to guard the environment, to guard the world very, very meticulously. But here, it sounds like there's a level of responsibility which was given to man to discharge where it's not simply that the world is our plaything per se, but we have a certain responsibility to preserve the world. And that's what uh, the Rav speaks about in terms of discrepancy between uh, these two different passages. And uh, the Rav Soloveitchik explains that uh, the, uh, the man who is described in the second chapter of creation, you might refer to as uh, the lonely man of faith. Um, the, the man who not only looks at uh, the world and thinks about how do the cosmos function and so what do I do to get the most out of them? But why do the cosmos function? Who is behind the cosmos? What is my sense of responsibility in terms of how I'm going to preserve the world and preserve the grandeur and the beauty of the world? In the Rub's own words, he says he does not create a world of his own. Instead, he wants to understand the living given world into which he has been cast. He encounters the universe in all its colorfulness, splendor, and grandeur and studies it with an avet, in awe and admiration of the child who seeks the unusual and wonderful in every ordinary thing and event. He looks for the image of God, not in the mathematical formula or the natural relational law, but in every beam of light and every bud and blossom in the morning breeze and the stillness of a starlit evening. Very poetic formulation by the Rav. Uh, the situation continues, Rav Soloveitchik, has deteriorated considerably in this century. He was writing uh, several decades ago uh, before the type of uh, environmental exploitation that we're all familiar with that has caused a, a noticeable depletion in the ozone la layer before global warming has become the norm the last six years we know have each been the warmest uh, uh, years on record in terms of the temperature which is constantly rising. So he says in this past century, which has witnessed the greatest triumphs of majestic man in his drive for conquest, majestic Adam has developed a demonic quality, laying claim to unlimited power, or last to infinity himself, itself. His pride is almost boundless, his imagination arrogant, and he aspires to complete an absolute control of everything, which the Rav obviously indicates is not the divine plan. The divine plan is uh, that on the one hand, this tremendous amount of uh, talent, uh, skill, resourcefulness given to man to be able to utilize resources for his own benefit is meant to be balanced by the imperative of the Avda or the Shama that we also have a, a responsibility to preserve the universe. This is perhaps expressed most poignantly in the Medrash Kohelis Rabbah that speaks about kias maase. It's a pasuk in Kohelis, Ecclesiastes. Kias maase alokim kimi yuchalas sakenis hasher ibso. It says reeis maase alokim see and observe, behold the work of a God, because who will be able kimi yuchalas saken? Who will be able to fix it? Eisha eis hasher ibso after it has been corrupted by man. V'sha shibara kadosh baruch hu es adam adam arishon when God created the first man not luvek ziba akulilani gan eden. So he showed him all of the trees of Gan Eden. Take a look at my handiwork, how beautiful it is. Everything I created was for you. Be careful. Don't destroy my world. Because if you destroy my world, 
there's nobody who's going to be able to fix it after you. Whatever is one's view or one's orientation regarding um, how much of the environmental problems that we have right now, the melting of glaciers, the loss of habitat, the potential extinction of lots of species that we were so accustomed to when we were younger as uh, just being facts of life, uh, lions and tigers uh, that now, and leopards so that uh, now uh, uh, are, are the types of things that you only see in Walt Disney cartoon movies, uh, but uh, otherwise are practically uh, non-existent in the world anymore. Um, so whatever you think in terms of man-made contribution to this phenomenon, um, on some level, the Torah tells us it's irrelevant uh, because we have an independent responsibility to see to it that our actions are going to uh, promote uh, the beauty of uh, the environment, the beauty of the world that HaKadosh Baruch Hu uh, created. We're not supposed to wantonly uh, destroy it and uh, create um, a, a, um, a state of desolation. Uh, we're not supposed to uh, ruin the handiwork of HaKadosh Baruch Hu so that we have this responsibility independent of how consequential our actions may be, even if they're only consequential a little bit. Uh, we have to make sure that we fulfill our mandate of being as careful as we can possibly be in this regard. And that's what leads us to the specific Torah prohibition against wanton destruction, which is found in Sefer Devarim, known as uh, Baal Tashris, um, where the Torah tells us explicitly, if you're going to besiege a city, in order to fight against the people in the city. So whatever wartime tactics you think may be appropriate, do not destroy any kind of a tree, um, which we understand is a fruit-bearing tree, according to Chazal, as it says in the Pasuk, because you have to eat the fruit of the tree. So therefore, you may not destroy it. And then there is this uh, quizzical comparison between man and fruits. Rashi seems to say that if you have a war against the human beings who are trying to kill you, the fruit trees are not trying to kill you. They're here to sustain you. So therefore, don't take out your wrath uh, against the fruit trees, uh, which you need in order to be able to live, which, I, which, uh, needs, uh, which needs to exist in order to be able to sustain the world. The commentary of the Panim Yafos goes beyond this and says that there is actually an intrinsic relationship and identification uh, between the human, uh, between uh, human beings on the one hand and uh, tree life on the other hand. Um, and he says uh, like this, uh, that a person's sustenance only comes uh, from the trees, from the natural resources that have given, have been given to us by a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And um, in uh, the event, says uh, that when there is a uh, sinful behavior on the part of uh, man, so then the natural resources suffer. And uh, so too, we have a sort of a midrashic um, uh, tradition uh, that uh, when the um, when the trees uh, did not obey the uh, the command of Hashem, who said uh, that uh, the taste of uh, the wood and the fruit were supposed to be the same, um, so uh, then uh, human beings were punished as a result of uh, the failure of a tree life uh, to heed uh, their purpose that was given to them by God in this world. So there is an intrinsic interrelationship between man on the one hand and the trees on the other hand. So now we understand the Pasuk that says, Ki is not necessarily a contrast, but it's saying be sensitive about plant life because your life is dependent upon plant life, is dependent upon having trees, is dependent upon having fruits um, that will be able to sustain us, that will be able to be part of God's plan of a creation. Furthermore, the Sefer HaChinuch, which gives us an explanation as to the meaning and purpose of various mitzvahs. Of course, you have to perform mitzvahs independent of whatever the specific reasons for the mitzvah might be, but we're still supposed to understand the purpose of the mitzvahs that Hashem gave us. So the Sefer HaChinuch says, with respect to two different mitzvahs, the mitzvah of Shiluach HaKan, which is sending away the mother bird 
when you want to take the chicks to eat the chicks that you don't take them with the chicks in front of the um, in front of the mother um, uh, that you have to separate uh, between them when you take uh, the eggs or you take uh, the chicks shalach to shalach to shalach is a banim tikach lach and also with respect uh, to uh, the mitzvah of osove as beno that you're not allowed to kill a mother and a child animal on the same day. So the Sefer Achino gives the same explanation as to the purpose for these mitzvahs, the Shechepzo Baruchu B'Kiyam Hamin, that a Kaddish Baruch who wants the animal species that he created to remain in existence. We can certainly understand this very well and derive it from the story of uh, Tevas Noach, when uh, Hashem told Noach to build the table, he's destroying the oyster, but preserve all the species that I created. You have to have two of each kind, or in certain cases, uh, 14 of each kind, um, if they're kosher animals brought into the table in order to preserve uh, the species. So therefore, Hashem inundates uh, in us uh, this message um, uh, through, uh, the, uh, the, through these mitzvot, of, a not, uh, of not slaughtering a mother and a child on the same day in order that uh, we should uh, be sensitized to the fact that we need to preserve the species. And so too sending away the mother bird before taking the children that we need to preserve the species. Because Hashem intends to exercise his providence over all creations that they should remain in this world. And if we keep this uh, mitzvah ourselves, then our reward will be that we will continue to be able to live um, uh, with uh, great uh, success uh, as well um, uh, through our uh, preserving the species that HaKadosh Baruch Hu had created. Um, uh, the, the Rambam, um, uh, when discussing the mitzvah of Baal Tashkis, that you're not allowed to destroy any kind of a, uh, of a fruit tree. So he goes on and he points out, and this is evident from many, many Gemaras, that apply this principle of a uh, baal uh, not only to uh, fruit trees, but really to any kind of object, to furniture, to clothing, um, uh, to animals, um, uh, that we're not supposed to destroy anything in this world that has a valuable purpose. Um, as says the Rambam, this is in Hilchos Malachim Perik Vav, Halacha Yud, um, uh, very prominently uh, discussed in Rabbi Schwartz's Sefer, so to anybody who wastes utensils, the korea begodim, or tears garments unnecessarily, bahore's binyan, um, and destroys buildings, or so simayan, and closes up a water supply. We can certainly um, identify with this notion when uh, the clean drinking water supply is in danger due to heightened pollution that has been taking uh, effect in this world. Umaabin Maholos Terachashkasa destroys the foods unnecessarily. Over below Sashkis is in violation of this prohibition of Los Sashkis of not destroying any kind of a fruit tree. The Minchas Chinuch commentary to the Sefer Chinuch says that even though the punishment of lashes is only given to somebody who destroys fruit trees, the Torah prohibition applies to any kind of wanton destruction whatsoever. But again, we have this balance. The balance on the one hand of majestic man, as uh, the Rav described, and uh, the uh, responsibility of the man of faith, to guard, to guard the resources that Hashem has uh, given us. We find this in uh, the uh, Psukim on the one hand, a pasuk t- teaches us la Hashem ha'aretz loa that the entire world belongs uh, to uh, Hakadosh Baruch Hu. On the other hand, ve'aretz nason lebnei adam, famous Gemara in Brachos, it says that before you eat um, a, a, a the fruit uh, of of the world, before you eat any kind of food, so it's la Hashem ha'aretz loa. Everything belongs to God. You're stealing from God if you take the fruit. But then at the end. It's ve'aretz nason lebnei adam. It belongs to you. So how do we reconcile these two different psukim? So the Gemara says in bracha staf lamin hey you have to make a bracha kan kodim bracha kan liacha bracha. Once you make a bracha, you make a blessing, so then you can eat the fruit. I think that this Gemara gives us a framework for dealing with environmentalism according to halacha. You have to deal with things with a bracha. 
with a sense of sacredness and sacred responsibility. That yes, uh, the resources in the world are intended to be utilized, but we have to do it with a sense of dignity. We have to do it with a sense of faith, of understanding that it all comes from a Kaddish Baruch Hu, and using the resources carefully and wisely. Um, there's even uh, the suggestion uh, that it is entertained in uh, the Gemara in Shabbos, that Haiman the Efshel Mishti Shikhra Vishasi Chama, somebody who could get away with drinking beer and instead he drinks wine, uh, which is more of a depletion of uh, resources of the world you're taking from the grapes. Over Mishum Baltashkis is violating Baltashkis, unnecessary destruction. You don't need to indulge yourself so much. But then the Gemara says, no, uh, we don't go so far. But Lab Milsi Baltashkis the Gufa Ad, that human beings have the right to enjoy the resources of the world. It's here for our benefit. If you prefer drinking wine, oh, don't, don't, you know, over, you know, indulge. But you think you prefer drinking wine over drinking beer, it's okay to drink wine. Um, uh, the Prima Godim in the Simon Chof Ches of Yoridea says uh, that at the same time, uh, you have to be, you know, careful um, uh, not to uh, engage uh, too much in the eating and the consumption of delicacies, just as much as you need in order to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but you don't have to deprive yourself either. There is an appropriate balance, even in terms of how you utilize the, uh, the resources. Um, and this uh, balance is uh, something which the postkin, which uh, the rabbinic authorities really struggled with uh, in terms of uh, applying uh, the halachos of uh, Baal Tashkis on a practical level, because the Ramam also says, and this is based on uh, the Gemara, when is it that you can't cut down a fruit tree? That's when uh, there is a no valid reason to do so, when uh, the benefit of keeping the fruit tree outweighs the benefit of cutting down the fruit tree. However, in uh, the event where it's mazik, Ilanos uh, I have a fruit tree which is causing more destruction than good because it's harming other fruit trees. Um, uh, or the monetary benefit from cutting it down would be far greater than the benefit of continuing to eat the, the trees. Um, so then you would be allowed to cut it. The Torah only prohibits it if it's in the course of uh, destroying it. Um, uh, but it's a very, very delicate balance. And in fact, uh, the uh, Gemara says uh, that if a person cuts down a fruit tree, there's a sakana involved, there's a danger involved as well. This is a very interesting uh, Gemara that we understand perhaps a little bit better based on uh, the comment uh, that we read before from uh, the Panim uh, Yafos, from the Baal Hafla, um, uh, that uh, the uh, that human beings and uh, and the fruit trees are kind of a, a kind of inter uh, intertwined with each other. Um, uh, so it's, there's, a, there's a lesson involved that if you cut down a fruit tree, you could be, be endangering your own life. And in fact, uh, that's what uh, the uh, the Gemara says. The Gemara quotes in Baba Kama from uh, Rabbi um, Rabbi Hanina. Rabbi Hanina says uh, that his own son uh, died. His own son was uh, was punished. He said his son only died of the cuts to Einta below Zimna. That he cut down a uh, fig tree um, before it was time for the fig tree to be cut down. Uh, and uh, therefore, he was punished in this very, very drastic and extreme manner. So uh, Rabbi Yaya Bachrach, who is the author of res the responsa known as the Chabos Yair, he lived around uh, 400 years ago or so. So he speaks about somebody who wants to cut down a fruit tree, sounds like a peach tree, a barsikin um, that just grew without his even planting, without his even planting it in his own uh, yard. Um, and it was uh, bothering him because it was obstructing the view from his window. So is, he, is this considered to be a sufficient basis, a sufficient justification for, um, for cutting it down? So he says, look, um, anything which is disturbing quality of life uh, would be a justification, but you have to do it in a measured and balanced way, says uh, the Chavos Yoyer, says Rabachrach Mikomok Mireh. Seems to me, if you're able to cut the, uh, uh, you're able to, um, uh, to remove uh, the uh, obstruction from your view by simply cutting a few of the branches, um, then don't, don't cut down the entire tree. 
Afalpi, despite the fact that this is going to create a little bit of a burden for you. What's the burden? You cut down the whole tree. You don't have to worry that eventually the branches that were obstructing your window are going to grow back over your window and you'll have to keep on cutting them down. He says, that doesn't matter. That's not so much work. That's not such a hardship. Even though as a result of you only cutting down a few branches and preserving the tree, they're going to grow back. We'd start lots of litroach, and you're going to have to exert an additional effort later on. Something which the Gemara describes as a sakana is not a basis for us giving you dispensation to cut down the entire tree, even though your continued responsibility of watching over these branches and having to cut off the branches as they continue to obstruct your view in future years is going to involve some more work. So we have a basis for this comment from the Kapos Yair, that your ability to destroy things, if it's going to make life easier, it has a limit. There are time, manner, place restrictions that we all have to abide by. If it's possible without too much trouble to go and to uh, wash your dishes in the sink and in the dishwasher. Nowadays, we even have dishwashers to make our lives easier rather than to buy plastics, which as we know, are polluting the world, are taking up a large uh, areas in our oceans and are decreasing the habitat of a fish uh, and underwater uh, uh, creatures um, and uh, ending up uh, causing uh, many underwater creatures uh, to, uh, to die, um, uh, even uh, to uh, be swallowing some of these materials and suffocating upon these materials and is causing terrible pollution that's also removing our ability to have, you know, a, a, a fresh water supply for the world and so forth. Um, so we have a responsibility to work a little bit harder. We don't have to be such mifunokim. As the Prima Godim says, you don't have to overindulge yourself. As the Chavos Yair said, a little bit of work uh, is appropriate in order to fulfill the la'avdo, la'shamo. We can have our cake and eat it too, so to speak. Uh, you can have, you know, all of the, the dishes that you need and all the furniture that you need and all the food that you need, but work a little bit harder. Uh, you don't have to go out and, and buy the plastics. Um, if it's a question that we now see that uh, the world is threatened because of uh, a heightened amount of carbon dioxide, uh, which has been released into the atmosphere and due to um, the, the greenhouse uh, effect, um, uh, that uh, the, we have many of these gases that are being trapped within the atmosphere, which is creating a global warming, endangering habitats uh, for many, many uh, animals and the like. Um, so uh, we can be a little bit more circumspect in terms of how much we drive our cars. If uh, there's uh, a short distance uh, to uh, be traveled and we can walk, it's also good exercise. It's also good in terms of our physical health. So we're able to walk some more and not drive so much. And we have to look into other types of measures uh, that uh, can be good for the environment, whether it be electric cars, as opposed to uh, the gas guzzling cars that we're currently using, um, and other such uh, measures um, that are within our control in order to make the environment a, a better place, because this is also part of our responsibility. Rosham Shin Rafal Hirsch um, said this really in two different ways. Uh, one way was in his letters that he wrote. He wrote um, a series of letters, and in letter uh, number 11, um, Rosham Shin Rafal Hirsch wrote um, uh, that we have a responsibility just like uh, we are supposed to treat each other with respect, uh, so too we have to treat with respect every single type of creation, even if it's not uh, a, a human being, um, even if it's not a living and breathing animal. From the land that Kodesh Baruch Hu has created um, that carries everything, including animals and including plant life. Each of them demand from you a certain amount of respect because they are the creation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Do not destroy any of these items. That you have to treat everything um, with a sense of uh, intelligence, um, with a, a sense of judiciousness. 
um, in terms of how you're going to be careful about preserving the world properly. The other statement uh, that Rosh Hashanah Rafael Hirsch famously said was he was afraid uh, that when he after he would die, he would come up to heaven and the Kodesh Baruch Hu would say, Shamshin, why didn't you see my Alps? I created such beautiful uh, scenery in this world. Why didn't you go to Switzerland and take a look at the Alps? So that's why he decided he's going to travel and check out the Alps, that we're supposed to enjoy um, the beauty of the world that, that a Kodesh Baruch Hu created. Supposed to enjoy the beauty of the world, we also have a responsibility to preserve the beauty of uh, the world as well. There's a Gemara in Tainus uh, that uh, makes uh, the following statement that uh, really drives this home on some level. It tells the story of Choni Amago. We know the Choni Amago slept for uh, 70 years. The Talmudic version of Rip Van Winkle, except the Talmudic version came first. So uh, the Gemara tells us he slept for 70 years, that we know, but why did he sleep for 70 years? The Gemara says it was to teach him something about conservationism. Um, Choni Amago saw a man who was uh, planting a tree. What type of tree was he planting? It was a carob tree. So Choni Amago said, how long is it going to take for this carob tree to develop until it's going to eventually bear fruit? So Amalei had Shibin Shonin. So the one who was planting it said, oh, you know, with carob trees, it takes a while. It takes 70 years. So Amalei, so Choni said to this fellow, I don't know how old the fellow was, but he probably did not have a life expectancy of those days that he was going to be around afterwards. Amalei, Pshitalak, the highest Shibin Shonin, you really think you're going to live another 70 years? So I'm a lay. So the fellow responded to Choni Amagel said, you think I'm doing this for, for myself? I've been doing this for future generations. I have a responsibility towards future generations, but it's not purely altruistic. It's also part of the human condition because I'm enjoying all the fruit of the labors of my predecessors. I'm a lay. Hi, Gava, I'm a Bacharuba, Ashkafte. When I was created, there were carob trees that were around that provided me with carobs. They wouldn't have been there if a people who came before me didn't altruistically and unselfishly plant carob trees that were there for me. Just like my forefathers planted these trees for me, I'm now planting these trees for my descendants. Um, so then, Choni Amago slept for 70 years. He got up. He saw somebody eating the carobs. So Amalei Atu the Shisal said, so he was startled. He said, oh, are you the fellow who planted the carob trees? So Amalei, so the fellow who was eating the carobs said, Bob Rayana, no, I'm his grandson. Um, and then Choni Amago, Amalei, oh, now I understand I slept 70 years. But he also understood that this is a part of our human responsibility in the world that just as we <laughs> came into a world with tremendous biodiversity. We came into a world with tremendous physical beauty, with natural resources, with all of these diverse animal species. We didn't have to go into some sort of an exotic zoo to see, oh, this is one of the 50 tigers that are left in the world. There were actually tigers running around roaming Africa. There were African elephants, there were Asian elephants. We didn't have to only go to the circus to see elephants. There were elephants that were living in the wild. It wasn't only something that we watched in a cartoon movie that this is uh, the world that we inherited. This is the world that we're responsible to bequeath to our children and grandchildren as well. This is the Torah way. This is uh, the reason for the mitzvahs. Uh, many of the mitzvahs in the Torah as uh, the Sefer Achinuch uh, teaches us in order to teach us this principle. And this is something which we find underscored by the Gemara and the commentaries and the Midrashim as well. Very, very clearly a Torah perspective. Just want to conclude by citing a Rambam in Hilchos Yisode Torah, where the Rambam tells us something very, very special about how we're supposed to view the universe in terms of our connection with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That once we have this sensitivity, we have this appreciation that the world is not our plaything, that we also have a part of, as part of our mission, this notion, as the Rav pointed out, of being a man of faith, that we have an understanding that we have, uh, that there's a who, that we were created by a Kodesh Baruch Hu, the rest of the world was created by a Kodesh Baruch Hu as well. So this leads us to a greater connection with a Kodesh Baruch Hu. This is what the Rabbim says, 
What's the way in which we come closer to Hashem? We after Hashem Elokecha, we have an obligation to love God. We arise Hashem and to fear God. The Shashi is born in Adam, the Master of Ruav and Ifloim and Gedolim. When we see the beauty, the thoughtfulness that went into God's creation, all of the creations, all of the creatures, all of His handiwork, all of the resources that Shkadish Baruch has given us, Vierimi and Chachmasa, we see the tremendous divine wisdom that went into it. Shein la erach locates that there is no limit to it. Miyano oiv and Mishabech and Mifar and Misabet Tavik Gedoy Leleda Hashem Agadol. So this is what gives us our burning desire to feel this closeness, to come closer to a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to appreciate a Kaddish Baruch Hu, to have a reverence for the Almighty. This is what enables us to fulfill the mitzvah of Avas Hashem, of loving Hashem and fearing Hashem. And part of the mitzvah of Avas Hashem is for us to discharge our responsibility towards the environment. Yes, enjoy the world. No question about it. But at the same time, to do it responsibly, um, to do it with uh, a sense of uh, carefulness um, and to make sure to enjoy the world while preserving its resources and also ensuring um, that the resources will be available for future generations in all of its grandeur and in all of its splendor that a Kodesh Baruch has given us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have a question for Rabbi Reese? Anyone? If not, then uh, Rabbi Reese, I have two thank yous for you. One is for um, giving a fascinating halakhic perspective on environmentalism today and for taking the time to make the preparations. And the other is something that I don't think any of you know, which is that I had a cancellation for today. And with only one week's notice, Rabbi Reese just jumped right in and gave us a terrific presentation today. So I thank you personally for that. Also, thank you to everyone who has participated today in the Zoom lecture. I hope you all enjoyed it. The STEM lecture for next week will be one week from today, January 12th at noon. The speaker will be Rabbi Sholem Fishbane, who is the Kashrus Director of the CRC. And his topic will be food manufacture and Kashrus considerations. Looking forward to hearing that. And uh, as I think you probably know, at any point in time, if you want to know what the upcoming STEM lecture is, it'll always be on the KINS website along with the link to log in. Again, thank you all for attending. Hope to see you all next week and have a wonderful day.